Welcome to part three of the third lecture of experimental vibration analysis. In this video, we continue the discussion of time domain analysis by looking at some applications of filters that we commonly use in vibration analysis. And the content of this video is found in chapter three of the book Noise and Vibration Analysis. In this video, we will look at three things. We will look at acoustic octave filters and then integration and differentiation of measured time signals. We're not going to cover all the content of chapter three here. Uh, you should read in the book about, for example, uh, smoothing filters, analog RMS integration and frequency weighting. So time domain acoustic A and C weighting filters, for example. There is support for all these types of filters in the Abravibe toolbox, so you can look it up and see how it's done. In this video, we will focus, as I said, on octave band filtering, integration and differentiation. 1 over n octave filters are standardized by the uh, IEC standard 61260 or in US uh, the stand ANSI standard S1.11. These two standards are harmonized, so the filter characteristics of the filters according to both standards are identical. These filters are particularly common in acoustics, but they're also used sometimes for vibrations. 1 over n octave filtering is done by applying standardized digital bandpass filters to the data and then analyzing the output of each of the bandpass filtered sequences. And the center frequencies are standardized and you find some typical frequencies in the book. Usually the output of each bandpass filter is analyzed by the RMS level of the uh, output. But usually you need to compute this RMS level similarly to an analog integration. You can look at uh, this up in the book. Filters then for one over n octaves can either be whole octave filters, which means that each center frequency is a doubling of the previous center frequency. Or it's also common to use one over, uh, over three, which is, are called third octave filters. Uh, then there are three such filters per octave band. Then in the old days also 1 over 6, 1 over 12 and 1 over 24 octave bands were quite common but today they're not so common because we can do high resolution FFT analysis as we will show later in this course. In Abravibe octave filters are implemented in the uh, command n oct filt, which produces filter coefficients for any 1 over n octave filter band. You can see the details in the book, or you can open the n oct filt command in Abravibe. Here is an example of an octave spectrum limited to the bands from 63 hertz to 4000 hertz. Also, typically, there is a total level that is the RMS level of the entire signal, uh, either plotted as here on the right-hand side or sometimes on the left-hand side of the plot. Each bar here displays the RMS level of the analyzed signal, which has passed the corresponding bandpass filter. So there is an octave filter at 63, the next one at 125 hertz, 250 hertz, and so on, up to 4K. The IEC or ANSI filters are specified by upper and lower bands as illustrated here. So the implemented filter has to have a characteristics that falls between these two limits. If you look at the Abravibe command anoct filt, you can see how that can be achieved by a third order Butterworth filter. As the specification here is formulated in terms of an analog characteristics, there is a risk that an octave filter with a particular center frequency and using data with a particular sampling frequency will not comply with the standard bounds if you try to attempt the filter design by a simple filter. For example, as I said, in Abravibe we use a third order Butterworth filter. The solution then 
is usually to resample the signal to a sampling frequency closer to the center frequency of the band in question. And actually, if you look at the NOC filt command in Abravibe, you will see that that command checks that the filter coefficients computed with the sampling frequency used comply with the standards. And if not, the command issues a warning. You should look into this command to learn how this is done. Next, we will talk about integration of time signals. As we very often measure vibrations by accelerometers or sometimes velocity sensors, it is common to want to integrate the vibration either into velocity or displacement. But integration is a difficult operation. And there are two reasons for this in vibration analysis. The first one, as mentioned here, is that the integration filter has a transfer function of 1 over s, the s being the, the Laplace operator. At frequencies close to DC, 0 Hz, this will create problems. The other thing is, as we will see in a minute, that simple integration methods often fail. First, we will look at a real example of integration of an acceleration signal. In the top plot here, we have an acceleration signal from a measurement uh, near the wheel hub on a truck driving on a road. And in this case, it's actually a dirt road of pretty bad quality. As you can see, the signal contains uh, some uh, high frequency vibrations. And on top of that, there are some very slow fluctuations. Note the time scale here, which goes over two minutes, zero to 120 seconds. The low, uh, low frequency fluctuations you can see in the signal here come from the road not being completely flat, but rather having some hills and valleys that the truck is driving over. Now, in the middle plot, you can see the velocity of the signal uh, from a direct integration of the acceleration signal shown. As you can see, the result is probably not what we are interested in. And we have to seriously question if the vertical speed has varied as much as plus minus 50 meters per second, as it's indicated here. In the bottom plot, on the other hand, uh, what we see is the same velocity signal, uh, acceleration signal at the top, uh, being integrated after being high pass filtered to remove frequencies below 5 hertz. As you can see, this produces a much more realistic plot although there is actually a printing error. Uh, the units are not in meters per second, but never mind that. Vibration of almost 500 millimeters per second would be devastating. The plot is taken from the book, so I don't want to change it in the video here. Now, why do we get pro the problem in the middle plot? Well, this is not necessarily due to the method of integration it is more a question of the accuracy of the acceleration signal. As most accelerometers we use are piezoelectric, they are not accurate at very low frequencies. So this means that the integral of the signal becomes wrong. We typically always have to apply some high pass filter to data before integrating accelerometer signals. So to sum this up, this is a common problem with low frequency content and usually we have to high pass filter the data before integrating it. The next thing is, however, that despite if we have an accurate acceleration signal to obtain an integral with high accuracy, simple digital filters, filter methods should be avoided. The simplest method for integration is to multiply the accumulated sum by the delta x. As we will see in the next slide, this is a rather badly performing algorithm. Now, in numerical methods classes, we are often taught that the trapezoidal rule uh, should be a superior method. 
However, in the next slide, you will see that the method, this method is also very poor. The next method you can use, for example, in the Ibervive toolbox is what I call a high pass filter method. This is actually a method equivalent to the analog filters that were built into old times charge amplifiers. I refer to this method as the HP or high pass filter method. In fact, however, it uses the one over Eps F slope of a first order Butterworth low pass filter as the integration. Thus, below the cutoff frequency, the filter does not integrate the signal, which is very convenient. That, and that's why I call it the high pass filter, because it's similar to a high pass filter followed by an integration filter. The performance, however, well, wait and see. The best integration method is to use the IIR filter implemented in the Abravibe toolbox and described in chapter three in the book. This command includes the possibility to set a high pass filter with selectable cutoff frequency. In this plot, we see the relative error uh, or the magnitude of the relative error in dB, which means that minus 40 dB is an error in magnitude of 1%. The x-axis in the plot here is the relative frequency as part of the sampling frequency up to the factor 0.5 being the Nyquist frequency. The first method, denoted delta sub 1, is the simple integration method. And as you see, it performs relatively poorly when you come above maybe a relative frequency of 0.01 or so. The trapezoidal rule, which is indicated by delta sub 2, is slightly better, but it's still performs poorly at frequencies above perhaps 0.05 or so. Then delta three is the high pass filter method. And as you can see, of course, that performs poorly at low frequencies where it does not integrate. But above, slightly above the, the cutoff frequency, um, it is performing similarly or equally to the trapezoidal rule. And then finally, you see the difference with the delta four method, the IIR filter method implemented here. This performs at a very accurate level up to a, a relative frequency of approximately two, uh, 0.25. This does mean that since the normal oversampling ratio is about 2.5, you need to upsample the data uh, when you use this method. This is however automatically done in Abravibe so the user does not have to think about it. The last thing we will talk about is differentiation. This is much easier to perform than integration because the transfer function of a differentiation filter is S in the Laplace domain or J omega in the frequency domain. And there is no problem anywhere to implement that. Still, however, to achieve high quality, you should avoid simple methods. Uh, you can look more in the book here, but if you compare these simple methods uh, by the more advanced method uh, indicated in this uh, function here, you see that the more advanced technique, which in this case is uh, using an optimization technique called parks mcclellan or sometimes referred to as REMAS, um, then you can get a superior integration, a differentiation, all the way up to a relative frequency of 0.4. So there is no oversampling uh, necessary or resampling necessary of most vibration signals if you use this method for differentiation. This concludes the current lecture. Now you can go to the book and read the uh, relevant chapter and uh, work through the examples at the end of the uh, chapter. Then you should also go to the chapter examples in the Abravibe toolbox and read through these and run them and make sure that you understand all the steps involved. If you haven't yet downloaded the toolbox, you sh should do so at www.abravibe.com. Welcome back to the next lecture when you have worked through this.